The content of this video is for educational purposes. Any decision to revise one's clinical practice is the sole responsibility of the individual clinician. Pregnant patient. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jeanette. And it, clearly, I'm going to start off with two comments, the first of which is that most women are very anxious about the childbirth process. And this certainly has heightened their anxiety. You just have to go to the lay press and realize that <clears throat> here are two examples, one of which came from NPR uh, just about three or four days ago. Uh, pregnant women are worried about the COVID-19 pandemic. And from the Tennessee, and we also learned that patients and doctors have unanswered questions. And hopefully I can answer a few of them. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, um, Jeanette, if you could roll the slide again, the next one. Uh, Jeanette? Well, at any rate, what I want to say is that an awful lot of what uh, the, uh, I may say here today is, is wrong, uh, mainly because what we know about this virus is accelerating very quickly over the next, uh, over, the, over a very short period of time. Looking at this chart, the number of papers that have been published is almost a mirror image of the number of people being infected in the United States on a daily basis. Uh, the next slide, please. So, what I really want to do is to talk about five things. First, the virology of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm sorry Curtis, I'm virus. having troubles with my computer is not, oh, not, not a problem. I, I actually have it up here as well. So I'm just going to talk on here. Okay. Eventually we'll see things. Uh, the pathophysiology, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's different about the presentation in the obstetric patient, how OB management is uh, affected and what, we know about how we might alter treatment. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how it, the outcomes in both mother and baby. And I kind of really do need the next one here because the next diagram exhibits uh, how the virus actually works. And I'm do it this way. It's working this way. I can't oh, get it to advance the other way. So yeah. at any rate, the, like all coronaviruses, the virus uh, enters the cell uh, by going through the ACE2 receptor. And one of the areas of research right now is to try and decide how that viral entrance can be uh, uh, affected mo much like the way it was done with HIV viruses. Uh, the virus uh, has its genome immediately uh, uh, becomes dispersed within the cell's uh, cytoplasm. And then uh, the genetic material uses a replicase and uh, and a protein that it produces that causes the genome to be uh, replicated. Now, the genomic RNA replicator uh, part of the, of the genome is actually snipped away from the, pro the RNA uh, genome that's required to create the, the various proteins that either encapsulate the genome or uh, provide the way for new viruses to enter the cell. That RNA migrates to the endoplasmic reticulum where the proteins through the standard replicase uh, ways of uh, manufacturing proteins cause those four proteins to be <coughs> created. Uh, the, there is an encapsulation that occurs before cell release in the Golgi apparatus of, uh, of the endoplasmic reticulum and upon exit, the, the virus gets, or the membrane protein of the virus takes part of the bilipid membrane of the cell along with it. And it's for this reason that the, the, the virus itself is relatively easy to disinfect against. And once you wash your hands and or uh, apply alcohol to it, it, it essentially falls apart because the bilipid membrane, which is kind of holding all this stuff together, gets disrupted. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. Now, if you examine where COX-2 inhibitors are found throughout the body, explain, explain uh, why the virus appears to have the, have the symptoms with which it presents. First of all, 
uh, there's a predominant or a very large number of ACE2 inhibit uh, receptors in <clears throat> the vasculature of the body and within the lung. So that may explain why people who have cardiovascular disease and hypertension may be at more greater risk because their ACE2 receptors are changed somehow because of idiopathic hypertension. <clears throat> and also since there's a predominance in the lungs, that may explain why pneumonia is a common cause of death and severe morbidity. There are some people who present with diarrhea and, and uh, vomiting, and that may be explained by the fact, again, ACE2 receptors are found in a very large number in that area as well. Hemoptysis and cough and nasal congestion uh, are some presenting signs, uh, but they may be related more to uh, effects of the virus and the inflammatory response. So let's go on to the, the next point and try to decide exactly why uh, this happens in women and how it affects it. It's unclear whether or not uh, ACE2 receptor uh, expression in pregnant women is different from those who are not pregnant, but at the moment it's also unclear why pregnancy may affect susceptibility even though the response on the part of the pregnant person may be, uh, may be altered. Uh, they present it apparently with the same amount of uh, disease, uh, morbidity, 80% will either be asymptomatic or mild, some 20%, 15% will develop a little bit of hypoxia, and some will require admission to the intensive care unit, about the same proportion as non-pregnant women. And the reason why women may be more susceptible or less susceptible lies upon the immune system alterations that occur naturally during pregnancy. There is significant alteration in the T helper cell lymphocyte response in pregnant women. Theoretically, their ability to ward off an infection should be reduced because their Th1 uh, helper cells response is actually reduced in pregnancy while that of Th2 which is to suppress the immunologic response and the cytokine interleukin reaction that occurs with an infection are actually upgraded slightly. Clearly alterations in cardiopulmonary reserve, which involves reductions in lung function and increases in blood volume, would theoretically make the reserve that the, that the pregnant person has less able to ward off the changes in cardiopulmonary uh, or at least the changes in the cardiopulmonary system that the infection would create. And that may theoretically improve or cause worse pneumonia or CHF. However, uh, how that is, is because as I'll get to in a moment, the, the outcomes in pregnant women appear to be somewhat better than in people who are not pregnant. Presentation and symptoms are identical. 84% uh, of women will receive with cough, some 15 to 20% or 30% with cough, and 85% with fever. Dyspnea, which is common during pregnancy, uh, at least in an acute onset or exacerbation, occurs in some 20%. And the laboratory investigations are really no different, showing lymphopenia, leukocytosis. And the imaging studies that can be done are very similar to those that are found uh, in the non-pregnant state. Next slide, please. So, uh, the problem with pregnant women is that an attempt to diagnose the viral infection on the basis of history and physical alone, alone becomes problematic because lots of women complain of shortness of breath, some 50% will during the course of their pregnancy, and nasal congestion occurs very commonly in pregnant women. Fever also occurs commonly from two sources primarily. One is obstetric complications, typically during labor, that uh, create infection, chorioamnionitis, and other reasons for infection. And epidural analgesia by itself causes unexplained fever. And there's some work to suggest that it's because of the immune response that local anesthetics and the production of an epidural creates. That said, cough or the rate of it is not increased during pregnancy and is a sign typically of pathology. And an acute change in the dyspnea that a pregnant woman feels is certainly pathologic a good deal of the time. 
and should be investigated and could be assigned. So if you look at imaging studies, you really know different. Uh, this uh, a chest x-ray on the right shows the typical kind of opaque appearance that uh, occurs in someone that has uh, the onset of the pneumonia associated. And as one feels that a CT scan will aid in the diagnosis of the pneumonia, uh, at least it's uh, regard from one Chinese study, highly sensitive and somewhat predictive in terms of its ability to make the diagnosis. Next slide, please. The whether or not uh, patients should be tested with regard to uh, COVID-19, a pot admittance to labor and delivery uh, is, is problematic. And this case report, and the literature has a good deal of them in it, suggests one reason why that ought to occur. And it was a 38-year-old woman who presented for labor, an induction of labor because of type 2 diabetes. So she has one risk factor already for development of the virus, which is diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> she presented without symptoms and, and without a history uh, that was suggestive of COVID-19 infection. And then during her induction develops a significant fever. Now, because obstetric complications occur commonly and chorioamnionitis does uh, occur at a greater rate in women who are having induction of labor and rupture of membrane, she was, uh, treated for it, and unfortunately had to go to the operating room because of uh, arrest of descent. Uh, during that time, she was also intubated, and then immediately after intubation, developed severe bronchospasm, and the diagnosis subsequently of COVID-19 infection was made, and she was treated with hydrochloroquine. Uh, the significance of this is that 15 healthcare workers were exposed to this uh, pathogen, an unknown number of which converted and an unknown number of which got seriously sick. It's on the basis of that that people have suggested that all women who are admitted to labor and delivery for delivery ought to go ahead and be tested. Next slide, please. It also highlights uh, this case report, the fact that the diagnosis becomes difficult because of the confounding uh, changes that occur during pregnancy and parturition. Now, the diagnosis requires transcriptase polymerase chain reaction testing. And while the generalized recognition for the sensitivity of tests is 91%, here at Vanderbilt, it's about 97%. It is highly specific at 99%. So the test is actually very, very good in terms of its laboratory ability to discriminate from someone who is infected versus someone who's not, especially if the test is given to someone who has uh, symptoms and signs that are suggestive of viral infection. This does not mean that pregnant women should not be tested for other respiratory pathogens if they're presumed to have pneumonia. And then during the course of treatment, remember that predictors of outcome in intensive care, uh, if the patient should be admitted there, and parameters for mechanical ventilation need to be altered because of the physiologic changes during the pregnant state. Treatment which has been focused on the NE retroviral remdesivir, which was actually developed during the SARS infection, another coronavirus, and chloroquine, both of which can be administered safely to an, infective, uh, an infected uh, parturient prepartum and can be administered to someone who's postpartum because it doesn't really show up in the breast milk. Obstetric management uh, in the non-seriously infected patient is really no different than it would be in the, in, in the, uh, in the, in the parturient who is not infected. And the management of the severe individual is, is individualized, uh, mainly because uh, most obstetricians think that the stress of the cardiovascular system is improved if the patient's delivered. Uh, the patient should be delivered on the basis of obstetric considerations. Steroid use is controversial. The CDC and, the, and ACOG are not on the same page because ACOG says that steroids should be administered and the CDC says it shouldn't. Use of magnesium is uh, on the basis of, again, of obstetric reasons. Next slide, please. Uh, now, this review of some 55 women from China published the third week of March suggests that maternal mortality may be less among women who become mechanically ventilated. 
<clears throat> in that study, two patients out of 55 had to go to the intensive care unit and required ventilatory support. None of those people died, which would have been expected, or at least one or both of them would have been died on the basis of statistics in non-pregnant and non-pregnant people. Fetal complications would appear to be largely related to obstetric problems, and the rate of preterm birth is so high because severely ill people were delivered preterm for the reason that I mentioned just previously. All neonatal deaths were actually due to uh, obstetric problems and not related to the COVID-19 because those fey infants did not become infected. Next slide. And then this is, as was found in the Chinese study, uh, at this particular point in time, there's no confirmed instance of neonatal illness that is related to COVID-19. Uh, two tested infants tested positive in one small series. The problem was that no one could figure out whether or not they'd been infected prior to the, uh, uh, prior to, or at least were infected after they were delivered. Viremia rates with this particular virus are low. And no virus has been demonstrated in the fluids associated with labor and delivery, and in breast milk for that matter, or in any neonate that's been delivered uh, to this point. And uh, I'm going to be quiet now. We got a lot more to cover. Uh, thank you, Curtis. Here's uh, the CME code. Um, I'm not sure if that's already been demonstrated in the chat session. I haven't been looking at the chat session, but here's the CME code for, um, for today. I'm gonna leave it up here for just a minute. Our next, uh, our next presenter is David Chestnut, and he's gonna be um, talking to us about what our national societies are saying and what the obstetric national societies are saying about COVID in um, pregnancy. Thank you, Jeanette, and good morning. I will review professional society guidelines from SOAP, ACOG, and Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine. First, it is unknown whether pregnancy affects susceptibility to COVID-19 infection. Physiologic changes of pregnancy may cause symptoms, such as shortness of breath and dyspnea, that mimic COVID-19 infection. And fever is common during labor, most often from chorioamnionitis. Conversely, COVID positive pregnant women may dismiss early symptoms leading to a delay in diagnosis. We know that pregnant women are at greater risk of severe morbidity and mortality from other viral respiratory infections such as influenza and the earlier version of SARS. And then centers in New York who have started universal testing of all obstetric patients admitted to the hospital have shown that a third of COVID positive pregnant women are asymptomatic at the time of testing and diagnosis. The guidelines recommend screening every pregnant woman before or at admission, including phoning the patient on the day before an elective procedure, screening the support person. They recommend that institutions prioritize testing of pregnant women, and some centers, not only in New York, but in Washington and even Nebraska, which has a low prevalence of infection, are now testing all obstetric patients at the time of admission. If COVID positive or a PUI, the patient should be admitted to an isolation room, preferably negative pressure, and the door kept closed. The patient should wear a surgical mask at all times, and a support person may be allowed per institutional guidelines. Next slide, please. We should minimize the number of in-room providers keep a log of all staff contact with the patient, use phone or video for pre-anesthesia assessment, conduct multidisciplinary discussions electronically, work with the neonatal team to plan separation of the infant from the mother after delivery, 
and then weigh risk benefit ratio of common obstetric drugs, including corticosteroids to accelerate fetal lung maturity, magnesium given for either fetal neuroprotection or maternal seizure prophylaxis, hemabate for postpartum uterine adeny because of its potential to cause or worsen bronchospasm, and dexamethasone for postoperative nausea and vomiting prophylaxis. During labor, amniotomy may be performed as indicated, and he, internal fetal monitors may be used if indicated. The guidelines recommend suspension of the use of nitrous oxide analgesia because it is an aerosolizing modality, and we have done that since mid-March. Also, last week, Vanderbilt suspended the maternal administration of supplemental oxygen for intrauterine fetal resuscitation. I might add this is an evidence-based recommendation. Uh, the evidence that giving supplemental oxygen to a normoxemic mother for fetal resuscitation is thin. We should use caution with systemic opioids because of the potential to cause respiratory depression and increase the risk, the need for intubation. We need to anticipate emergencies as the response time for urgent cesarean delivery will be delayed. And accordingly, a trial of forceps should probably be performed in an operating room so that if the trial fails, it will be easy to convert to cesarean delivery. We should encourage early neuraxial labor analgesia to increase the likelihood of using that for cesarean and avoiding the need to intubate the patient. It should be administered by an experienced provider with provisions for backup coverage. A runner should remain outside the room. There should be a separate COVID-19 neuraxial procedure kit or cart, and rescue medications should remain inside the labor room. Guidelines, of course, recommend droplet and contact precautions with eye protection per institutional guidelines. Now, with regard to airborne protections, it gets a little more contentious. ACOG adds that airborne protection is preferred. Currently, SOAP only recommends N95 masks for aerosolizing procedures. But <clears throat> the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine with ACOG is pressing the CDC to recommend more liberal use of airborne protections on the labor floor. The society says, given several variables unique to childbirth, including length of patient contact, repeated and prolonged exhalations, and often substantial exposure to body fluids, it is reasonable to consider N95 mask use for healthcare workers caring or suspected or confirmed COVID-19 in the second stage of labor. The society has hospital leadership to prioritize the labor and delivery department in the distribution of PPE resources, including N95 masks. At Vanderbilt, the neonatal resuscitation team will wear full PPE, including N95 masks, regardless of the mode of delivery. Next slide, please. We should consider temporary separation of the mother and baby until the mother's transmission-based precautions are discontinued. Breastfeeding or pumping is still recommended. There is no evidence that the virus is transmitted through breast milk, but the neonate may be at risk of infection via respiratory droplets while breastfeeding. At Vanderbilt, the mother may breastfeed immediately if she is a febrile and is able to control the respiratory symptoms. Insets are likely safe in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic women, but data are lacking. And then we should consider postponing elective postpartum tubal sterilization. Finally, what are the considerations in the setting of worsening respiratory status. I think all of you are familiar with the idea that in settings of maternal cardiac arrest that evacuating the uterus, that is delivering the baby, may not only 
rescue the baby, but may facilitate resuscitation of the mother. It is unclear how that applies or whether it applies to settings of worsening respiratory status in women infected with COVID-19. I am aware of one case from the West Coast uh, from last Sunday where uh, a mother intubated in the ICU on 100% oxygen, worsening status, was delivered at 29 weeks, hoping that it might improve her condition. And as of last night, she had improved somewhat uh, with the reduced FIL2, but still a long way to go. Likewise, fetal considerations are difficult whether or when you would intervene to deliver a baby before the mother might worsen to avoid prolonged fetal exposure to uh, maternal hypoxemia. Thank you. Here's the code again for anyone who missed it. Um, I think it's probably in the chat by now too. I haven't looked at the chat. Our next uh, speaker is gonna be Su Dr. Susie Dumas. Um, she is going to be talking to you about some of the policies and, and protocols that we've put in place here at Vanderbilt on labor and delivery. Thank you, Jeanette. The next slide, please. Um, we here at Vanderbilt have um, chosen to make a, this, the OR readiness a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, so we've included not only ourselves from anesthesia, but our OB teams, our OR techs, our NICU, as well as our nursing teams. We've uh, gotten together resource books, checklists, and we do pre-briefs for all cesarean sections. Um, the, resource, oh, the resource books um, are compiled um, by each area and updated on a daily basis. Um, so what that means is it's a little labor intensive because the uh, data or the information coming out is changing each and every day. So we have designated people to do that. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, Jeanette. Uh, we've decided to uh, get a pre-brief checklist together for all cesarean sections. Now, we normally do pre-briefs or huddles prior to cesarean sections anyway, so this is not necessarily a huge change, but what this checklist does is inform everybody about the patient's status. Um, it informs the NICU that we have a COVID-positive patient. Um, we designate uh, the C-section, whether it's emergent, urgent, or indicated. We go through the patient's history. We review uh, the team members that are going into the room because one of the important parts of this uh, procedure is making sure that we limit contact with multiple um, care providers. So we designate an anesthesiologist attending um, and the most senior um, uh, in-room provider on the floor. So that will be one of our senior residents or a CRNA. Uh, the OB attending and their most senior resident or uh, fellow are also in the room. We have one OR tech, the circulating nurse, and the NICU team has designated three people per baby. Uh, one change that is um, a little bit difficult on labor and delivery and is not sort of what we uh, always see is that we have uh, decided that there will be no visitors in the operating room. So as, anesthesi as the anesthesiologist at the head of the bed, we are um, also the support giver for the patient. Um, in this pre-brief checklist, we also review what the PPE will be for each person and go through the N95 goggles, face shields. We watch people donning uh, their PPE to make sure that it's done in a proper way. We designate a runner. And if, that, uh, if there's anything that's needed in the operating room that we don't have, that runner will be the person to go get it or find out where we can get it. We take off all of our phones, our pagers, give those to the people who are outside the room. Um, and once uh, the uh, OR is ready, then we proceed. Um, we review also what will happen in case of a uh, needed general anesthetic for an emergency and what that will, um, how that will change management. Um, 
in the operating room. And now we have at this time the luxury of having a COVID ready operating room and that is currently GYN OR1. So we've taken everything out of that room that is unnecessary. We've placed it in the GYN PACU. You can see that picture on the right. That includes the bluebells, our um, crash carts, um, anything that was extraneous has been taken out. We have also made COVID ready uh, packs. Those include all the things that you'll need to, to perform an, an emergency intubation, as well as um, things for anti-nausea and um, uh, different uh, uh, needles and syringes and things like that. So we're trying not to waste uh, supplies. The middle picture is sort of our is a uh, our setup that we have. We have multiple different pairs of gloves. We have. IV kits, we have our drugs out, and um, that then, because uh, once the, this patient is done, then everything on that tray has to be discarded. So again, we try to minimize everything. In the Bluebell uh, is an emergency kit for uh, all the drugs that we need. So when you do get your uh, COVID patient going to the operating room, you not only get your COVID bag, but you go to Bluebell and get the drug uh, bag that's uh, designated in there. Next slide, please. This is a setup. Originally, we had set up OR2 for our COVID uh, deliveries. Uh, however, now that we have the space available in GYN, um, we're using that room instead. But this is an example of what the room should look like and what uh, we need to bring into the room prior to starting the case. And again, it's limiting all the medications and this can be set up for any room. We do, uh, we are trying to anticipate that as our volume of COVID patients increases, that we will be able to do this in any one of our operating rooms. Finally, this is the sequence of events for cesarean deliveries in the COVID patients. Um, we try to anticipate anything that can happen, whether that's uh, we go back to the operating room with an epidural that's functioning and then becomes non-functional, whether we need to replace it um, or whether we need to uh, perform a general anesthetic, but this designates who's in the room uh, at certain times, when they need to step out, what PPE they will be wearing, and when um, the NICU team arrives to uh, help with uh, the baby. It also talks about uh, the HEPA filter being in place and um, trying to make sure that if we do need to intubate in an emergency intraoperatively, that the, the team members are stepping back six feet during that emergency intubation. Um, in a anticipated general anesthetic, we do have uh, everybody stepping out during the intubation and then coming back in once the airway is secured. So here's the CME code. I'm sure most of you already have this um, and I'm confident it's been uh, put in the chat at this point. <clears throat> so uh, next, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Dumas. Uh, next, I'm going to be kind of giving you a crash course in obstetric anesthesia, um, just in case, in case you're needed. For some reason, I keep getting stuck on my slides here. I'm just going to go back to this format. Okay, so why would we potentially need you on OB? We are a 24-7 service. As you heard, uh, the majority of obstetric patients are going to be asymptomatic, so we may get inadvertent exposure, not knowing that our patient, even though they're screened uh, for symptoms, if they're asymptomatic, we may be exposed and not know it. Hopefully, we won't be sort of dropping off like flies, but just in case, I just wanted to distill down OB anesthesia for you to its very basic elements and also try and reassure you that if you end up coming up to OB that you will be well taken care of and there is nothing to fear. And after watching the ICU grand rounds last week, uh, I can tell you that our documentation is a hundred times better um, or simpler. So uh, it's uh, another reason why you might want to come to OB uh, voluntarily. COVID couldn't have struck at a, at a worse time. We're actually doing 
refurbishments up here on labor and delivery, if you haven't heard that already. The four north areas where we usually do uh, 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 labor patients. We have a couple of our L&D rooms down. So we are also delivering in four south. We have two labor rooms on that side right now. Uh, now that we get a couple of COVID or uh, patients under investigation every other day, we're actually preferentially putting them on four south. And then we also have our MCE rooms where we are also unfortunately laboring women. So we have three different locations in which we are laboring women. This star is where our primary workroom is. So you can see communication can be um, a big challenge. And I'd say that the basic skill sets, uh, in case you're wondering if you would be a good obstetric anesthesiologist or care team member, communication is really one of the main um, one of the main priorities in our skill sets and you can see why if you're in three separate places and have a multidisciplinary team that you're trying to communicate with you really do have to be a good communicator we have plenty of obstetric emergencies so you have to be okay with um, with being called last uh, last minute for an emergency obviously neuraxal techniques are uh, our bread and butter, and you have to also be very comfortable with managing massive blood loss. So with the communication piece, we use roll phones uh, among all the multidisciplinary team members. Uh, don't be afraid to reach out to anyone that you need to reach out to. Know who your multidisciplinary team members are. I'll go through uh, each one of those people, the primary people that you would communicate with on the labor and delivery floor. We get to know all of the patients on our units, whether we think they're gonna need an epidural or not because of the, because of the likelihood of emergencies. And then we have multiple, multiple um, sort of rounding opportunities or touch points for the multidisciplinary team, including safety rounds, which are uh, twice a day pre-briefs before any unscheduled cesarean delivery. We have the OB sign outs twice a day. We were doing bedside rounding for a while. Uh, now we're trying to figure out how to do this remotely uh, with Zoom meetings. And we do debriefs after emergencies. And particularly now we're doing debriefs after every patient that we take care of who is under investigation for COVID or has COVID so that we can continuously improve our systems processes. So our team uh, in the COVID model, we have leaned down a bit, uh, mainly because we were trying to provide more residents to other areas. Uh, during the day, we have two attendings, and then we have either a senior resident or a fellow now um, on the floor, a junior resident and a CRNA. If it came to the point at which we were out of obstetric anesthesiologists and our regional and APS people who come over here um, are accustomed to doing OB, we would preferentially obviously put you on a day shift where there is uh, another attending who um, can help you out. At night, we have one attending, one senior resident, a junior resident, and a CRNA. We also have roll phones for each of our um, each of our team members so that we can reach each other easily. The model on labor and delivery is that the midwives tech, uh, preferentially run the vaginal deliveries with an intern or a PGY-3. The obstetricians are kind of a backup for consultation and for any operative deliveries. Uh, our MFMs are consultations, obviously, for high risk. They do, uh, they accept outside transfers and they also manage primarily antepartum women who are on bed rest or high risk uh, pregnancies. And then our charge nurses is, is managing bed assignments um, and outside hospital transfers and also OR assignments. So it's critical that we are touching base with all of these team members during the day. Our obstetric emergency team deals with mainly fetal heart rate decelerations and postpartum hemorrhage. Those are our two uh, 
main reasons why an OBET would be called. We have other reasons why we would call an OBET, many of which are, are rare, but um, uh, the OBETs go out to all of the roll phones as a broadcast. <clears throat> the fetal heart rate tracings, I would say you don't have to really worry about reading this. Most of, most of us do know how to, uh, how to read fetal heart rate tracings. You just need to know that category one means the woman's laboring and the baby looks great. Category three means you have to go for cesarean delivery. Um, and then the majority of these strips fall into category two, which is this no man's land, which requires Again, communication with the midwives, with the obstetricians, MFMs, to sort of decide, well, how much longer do we want to look at a category two tracing? Is the woman progressing in her labor? Is she not? Are we more likely to end up in C-section or actually be able to eke out a vaginal delivery? Uh, Dr. Chestnut spoke about the reasons why we prefer neuraxial techniques for COVID patients very obvious, trying to minimize that uh, huffing and puffing that uh, ACOG is worried about um, uh, in transmitting potentially COVID and avoiding general anesthesia if there is an emergency cesarean delivery. So we do wanna do early epidurals. And then of course, there are all the, the advantages we know of that it's the best form of labor analgesia that, um, and that we can uh, minimize placental transfer of medications for labor analgesia. Disadvantages, again, most of you uh, know these, all the contraindications and the complications associated with neuraxial technique. And I'm, I'm not really here to give you all of the details about neuraxial technique, but to kind of reassure you that um, we've tried to simplify things as much as we uh, can. I'm going to see if I can get into this slide so that you can see this. <clears throat> so we have a lot of standardized um, uh, standardization and protocolization on our labor and delivery floor and it makes things pretty easy. Uh, initiation of neuraxial labor analgesia, we do that either via combined spinal epidurals or epidural dosing. Either way, we have a pre-made 10 mil syringe for spinal dosing. We use two mils of it for epidural dosing, we use 10 mils. So pretty straightforward, easy. Maintenance, we also have a pre-made bag of uh, bupivacaine 0.0625% plus fentanyl. So it's a pretty low dose local anesthetic so that women can continue to move their legs. Um, and also know that our pumps are all pre-programmed with programmed intermittent epidural bolus as well as patient controlled epidural analgesia. Again, really simple. It's the default mode on our, on our epidurals. So again, making it easy. Our redoses, we have a top-off algorithm. You literally just follow the algorithm and you will be A-OK -okay with any uh, redose and deciding whether you need to replace the epidural. And our top-off algorithm has uh, reduced time to uh, replacement. And of course, for emergency dosing, we use one of two local anesthetics, either chlorprocaine 3% or lidocaine 2% plus epi. Whether an instrumental delivery or cesarean delivery just um, is a variant on how much volume you give. Again, I'm going through this really quickly. You will have access to these slides, but I'm trying to show you that everything is really quite standard. Neuraxial techniques for cesarean delivery, Again, we're trying to avoid aerosolization in our COVID patients. Uh, there's a case series out from New York and Michigan showing you know, they've used Draxel analgesia with no problems in COVID patients. There was some indication early on from some uh, literature that came out of China saying there was uh, hypotension in COVID patients, but if you use a phenylephrine infusion, um, the, the US experience has not seen any real difference um, in hypotension and it was probably uh, somewhat anecdotal and not applicable to the US it, or for those who use phenylephrine infusions. And then obviously there are the advantages and disadvantages of using Raxel technique for cesarean delivery like avoiding the pregnant airway, the patient can be awake for the birth of their baby, um, and uh, minimizing intrauterine exposure exposure to general anesthetic. 
Turner Axle Techniques for Cesarean Delivery are also um, quite simplistic. Uh, we use hyperbaric bupivacaine and fentanyl for most patients uh, for spinal dosing. The only exception are buprenorphine women. There are uh, high rates of failed spinals with, um, with fentanyl, mainly because it's just not, uh, it, it doesn't work in them and then they don't get a dense enough block. Uh, so using clonidine instead is um, how we deal with that and that works really beautifully for those patients. I already talked about epidural dosing, but our post-operative analgesic regimen is very similar. Um, we're using naraxal morphine, that's the gold standard. We use NSAIDs and Tylenol as well for post-operative analgesia. And if we can't use uh, neuraxal morphine, then we use tap blocks. Those have been uh, shown to reduce opioid consumption in women who um, go for cesarean delivery and can't use neuraxal morphine. So neuraxal techniques for cesarean delivery in our COVID patients. This is our wonderful Dr. Tran, who is our fellow. He, um, uh, Dr. Dumas went through some of this, but basically for our COVID patients, we're using our personal protective equipment just like we are in the main OR. We have our pre-brief checklist that's specific for the PUI COVID patient so that uh, we cover all of, the, um, all of the items that are unique to, uh, um, to our COVID patients, making sure everyone has their personal protective equipment on. Regional technique is always preferred so that we do not do an aerosol uh, generating procedure, but even in patients, but because we have asymptomatic pregnant women, we are using our personal protective equipment just like in the main OR, um, full, uh, full personal protective equipment for every cesarean delivery right now. And if we do have to do a general anesthetic, we are following the departmental intubation and extubation guidelines, except for unanticipated general anesthetics where the team steps away. And for postpartum hemorrhage, also be reassured that we have a cognitive aid for postpartum hemorrhage. It really um, helps the team organize around the postpartum hemorrhage. You follow step-by-step step at each um, stage of, of blood loss. Um, it really helps everyone get organized and make sure that they do all of the action items that are required in a postpartum hemorrhage so the patient has the best outcome. And again, if you follow this checklist, you will be golden to um, manage a postpartum hemorrhage. As you can see, it's not so bad being on labor and delivery. We have a um, great team and we do have fun up there. And of course there are babies, so. Uh, I'll stop here and let uh, Matt, if there are any questions that people have or that you saw on the chat, um, please let me know. So <clears throat> thank you team for a phenomenal presentation. Um, I know some people uh, the past couple of weeks have been sending in uh, questions privately to, uh, to the speakers. So, um, if anybody has received some in their, uh, their chat queue, um, feel free to, to read those. Uh, I may have missed it, and, and I know that what, what you're doing with the, um, the COVID positive or the patient under investigation, um, but due to the high percentage of asymptomatic patients, um, are you putting masks on all moms uh, at this point? Or, and if I missed that, I apologize. We aren't. Um, there are some institutions that are putting masks on all mothers. Uh, I think that, you know, it's always this balance between how much PPE do we want to um, give to every woman coming in through uh, labor and delivery. Um, it's something we've talked about, um, but uh, but in New York, where there's where we know there's a very very high um, community. Uh, positivity rate, they're putting masks on everyone. Um, we have not gotten to that yet, um, but uh, I mean, it's something to consider and to keep talking about, I think. I think the biggest thing is that there is a push uh, to try to test every OB patient in some places, but obviously the lack of test kits 
yeah, it makes that almost impossible. But that they are, I think it was um, Egg Hug. Um, and David, you can chime in and let me say for sure, but Egg Hug recommending testing all pregnant patients. And a, a question came through about um, should we use no NSAIDs for COVID patients? That's actually been um, discounted in general in the sense of could we use a perioperative dose? Um, you know, there were some of the early, early concerns with all the questions about ACE inhibitors and, and NSAIDs. Is, is there anything, um, uh, at, is there anything in COVID positive women that you're doing anything different with NSAIDs? So data are lacking, Matt, and the, the current recommendation is probably okay for postpartum analgesia if asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but again, data are lacking. Excellent. And um, as you know, we may have, uh, certainly all the residents have rotated through there, but as we may have, like you mentioned, attendings or CRNAs who are called into duty, um, there, I thought you did a phenomenal job showing what you've done as a team with um, the the equipment and the layout and, and those things. Um, can you describe a little bit just practically what you've done as far as training? Susie mentioned observing each other in a dyad for donning and doffing and, and for anyone who would come. I thought all the protocols you went through were terrific. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what we could expect if we came and did a shadowing day in order to get up to speed, particularly with just the PPE in your setting. So, uh, so Susie has been really instrumental in um, making sure that the policies and protocols um, across uh, across all the multidisciplinary teams are um, shared. So there's a whiteboard, and there's also multiple resource books that people can look through and um, and have it at their fingertips. Um, you know, obviously there's the there's the online um, folder that you've put together and we've uploaded all of our policies and protocols into there for COVID patients in particular. Um, but for, but there's also resource books that um, Susie's keeping updated so with all of those protocols so that they're at your fingertips as well. Um, uh, obviously, if someone came up um, to orient, um, you know, all of the other things like dosing. Um, there are cheat sheets that we have that the, the residents used to have, and I'm, I'm trying to track them down um, and make sure that we have them uh, at our fingertips so that, um, so that we can also give those out as well to um, any attendings that might have to come up and, uh, or, or CRNAs. I mean, we'd have to be in some dire straits to, to have to orient uh, attendings and CRNAs up here because we do we do have quite a few of us but again you never know. I think we're also uh, don't forget that we have uploaded things onto SparkLearn so if you go on SparkLearn you go on to you know adult side and then there is a list um, under obstetric anesthesia that has a lot of our just standard policies and procedures for day-to-day you know, use on for labor and delivery. That's a great point. We'll make sure um, if, if uh, to get that link out um, again in the daily update, uh, just to follow on with this. Uh, so Matt, I just had a, a, a question by text about care of the uh, critically ill COVID positive pregnant woman in the ICU and about proning. I think I think proning would be um, would be uh, probably technically impossible in the latter half of pregnancy. Um, and if anyone wants to disagree, uh, feel free to to, to, to chime in. Um, I, I refer to a case from the West Coast Sunday where they did perform a cesarean in the ICU in an intubated patient at 29 weeks gestation. And uh, if, if it came to that point of, of doing a cesarean on an intubated critically ill patient who's in the ICU, I think that would be a discussion between the ICU team and the 
maternal fetal medicine team as to whether to do it in the ICU or transfer the patient to the operating room. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, issues with transferring a patient like that. You would want to avoid it. On the other hand, no one wants to get into uh, significant bleeding outside of an operating room. So th those are tough decisions. Um, looks, we have time for a few more. Uh, somebody asked, are we seeing an increased use of antioxidants uh, such as vitamin C? Um, and what about G6PD and the use of antimalarials? I, I personally uh, know of no increased use of antioxidants. And, uh, and the other thing is that about G6PD and antimalarials, well, since chloroquine is correct, well, right now, whether or not chloroquine is even effective is, uh, is kind of a mood, is, is problematic because no one's ever done anything to look at a control group with COVID-19 or has a group of them that hadn't gotten it with a uh, matched severity of disease. So to say that, that you'd use it in that patient and it was someone that was pregnant, uh, I, I don't think I would. Excellent. Um, and it, it looks like there's a lot of questions coming in as far as, you know, the potential cases of um, vertical transmission. Curtis, you had spoken to that. Um, I, I know I've seen on news feeds a couple of potential case reports pop up. Um, do we know, do we have any idea of whether we think mechanistically it's not possible or just that it hasn't been confirmed? It, it, it really hasn't been confirmed. Uh, the, the problem is in the individual neonate, trying to determine whether or not it was the environment that made them test positive uh, versus uh, in utero transfer. Uh, and I just actually just yesterday evening for this talk, I went and looked at the, uh, the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists website. And that was updated on the 6th of April. And they, had, they have one statement in there that says to date, there's not a confirmed case. So again, stay tuned. Matt, if I could add a couple of things, not related to your question, but because of time, I, I uh, skipped over. The, the first thing is that the, uh, the CDC a few days ago took pregnant women off the list of people who might be at increased risk for uh, severity of illness with COVID-19. And the uh, ACLG and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine have published a joint statement saying that that was a premature decision, that the data are lacking yet as to whether or not, um, you know, whether or not that would be, um, is correct. The other thing is that uh, in preparing for the lecture today, I also reviewed guidelines from Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, those professional societies. They talk about uh, the potential for delaying elective cesarean delivery at term or induction of labor. Let's say it's scheduled for 39 weeks gestation. And if, the, if in the screening and uh, the pa you have a symptomatic COVID positive patient, they talk about potentially delaying the cesarean or delaying the induction several days or a week or so, depending upon fetal condition, to wait until the patient is no longer symptomatic to minimize exposure to healthcare workers. Now that's not addressed at all in the United States guidelines, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. So Thanks. I also want, I, I also just want to be um, clear that there are many, many um, reports of pregnant women with COVID out of, New, out of New York who did not 
uh, where their babies were born without COVID. So even though there are these, we've just focused on the couple of cases that may or may not have been vertical transmission, I wanna point out that there have been many women with COVID who, are, who tested COVID positive, whose babies were absolutely unaffected. Excellent team, thank you so much. Um, uh, one closing comment and then a question. Um, first off, thanks again to Nathan for last week for a phenomenal presentation and update uh, in the COVID area, uh, era for critical care um, for the team today uh, with um, obstetrics. And then next week, uh, we'll be having a similar presentation, but related to the um, pediatric patient. Uh, and then a final uh, question, Jeanette, do you want to make a comment about um, baby showers in the era of COVID and, uh, and what, what recommendations we all should be making to our friends? This should be over Zoom, but I was just saying that it's probably some of the reasons why we have a lot of COVID positive patients uh, who are pregnant is because they had um, baby showers about a month ago. <laughs> All right, team. Well, everyone have a great day. Uh, stay safe and stay well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, guys.